So today, uh, being Mother's Day, I wanted to talk about a subject that I think is very important to all of us. And that is, uh, the sermon title today is called, uh, When Prayers Are Answered. And I wanted to talk about the topic of prayer. Because the thing is, is that if you were to define in a simple way what is prayer, I would say kind of the most simplest way to define it is, it's you talking to God. That's prayer. But if you were to ask me, is prayer simple? I would say absolutely not. Because prayer can be very hard. It can be difficult. It can be confusing. And the reason why we know this is, is because many times in the Bible, what do the disciples say? Lord, teach us to pray. If prayer was that simple, we wouldn't need to be taught it, right? And we do know, though, that prayer definitely is important. And how do we know that? Because we saw in the life of Jesus himself, what did he do continually and constantly? He prayed to God. And why is that significant to know? Because Jesus himself, who is God, was still praying to God. And there's a very interesting passage in Romans chapter 8, which talks about the Holy Spirit. And it's a wonderful passage. And Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit, who is also God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, the Holy Spirit himself, it says that he intercedes to God the Father on our behalf. In other words, God, the Holy Spirit, prays to God the Father for us. And what's even cooler is that it says that he prays in groans that words cannot express. In other words, the Holy Spirit prays deeper for us to the Father than we ourselves are capable of praying. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And what it goes to show you is, is that the devil wants to convince you that God doesn't care about you, God doesn't love you. But what the Bible tells us is, is that God loves you more than you can comprehend and that, he, and that he will do whatever he can to bring you to glory. And that's what Jesus did by dying on the cross and rising from the grave. That's what the Holy Spirit does now. If you're a believer in him, Jesus said, I'm sending to you a counselor, and he's going to dwell with you forever. And at Pentecost, that's what happened. The Holy Spirit came and he dwelt in the believers, and the Bible says that he will dwell with us forever. So what a great promise. But I want to talk today about prayer, because when I say prayer is difficult, it's difficult because all prayers don't have all the same answers. And, when, and I think the common thing is when we say an answered prayer, what do we mean by a prayer is answered? All right. You, what's that? Not what I want. Yeah, exactly. Usually an answered prayer is yes. Right? That's the answered prayer. Okay? But what if God answers no? You know, that's still an answered prayer, isn't it? Not always our desire. But it's still an answered prayer. And what if God answers wait? Because that's also an answer that he gives us. And sometimes that can lead to almost feelings of distress or despair. Because there are times in your life where you're really, really praying for something. And in all, in all rights, in all sense, it makes sense. Like in other words, when a parent is praying for the health and survival of their child, right? Why shouldn't that answer be yes every time? And when those things don't happen that way, we don't understand that. It breaks our heart. And we're wondering, God, why did I spend all this time praying and praying and praying just for it not to happen? And it, and it can lead to those feelings of despair because then you're kind of like, well, why bother? And then as the more we know about God himself, how we know that God is sovereign above all things and that God's will is what's going to happen. And yet we know that even though God is in control of all things, there are things that he lets happen on earth that we don't understand. And so it makes us wondering, God, why are we praying to you or why are we praying to you specifically about certain things if necessarily that isn't going to happen? But you know, what's funny is, is that uh, one of my former pastors, and some of your former pastors, Pastor Lee, he used to have a saying that he always used to say. He would say, prayer changes things. And the Bible proves that prayer does change things. Because some may say, why pray? God's going to do what he wants. But we see repeatedly in the Bible 
that God does respond directly to prayer. And sometimes things are going one way until someone intercedes, and then it goes a different way. For example, when you want to talk about a yes prayer, uh, the king Hezekiah, who actually was a good and godly king, Isaiah came to him because Hezekiah was sick. And God told Isaiah to tell him, tell Hezekiah to get his affairs in order. He's going to die from this sickness. And when Hezekiah heard the news, it said that he rolled over and went before the Lord and prayed to him. And Isaiah was walking out of the palace. And all of a sudden, God stopped Isaiah right in his tracks and said, go back and tell Hezekiah that I'm going to give him 15 more years to live. You see, Hezekiah was going to die. The prophet told him to get his affairs in order, and yet he prayed for life, and God said yes. And Isaiah was sent back to do that. So we see that there is a prayer where God said yes when something was going to happen, and it changed to something more favorable. And yet there also is times where we do see that no matter how much prayer happens, God still says no. And that example is an example we see in the life of David. When David sinned with Bathsheba, she became pregnant and had a child. Now, certainly the child did nothing wrong. The child didn't sin. It was the parents that did. And yet God, as soon as the child was born, struck the child with an illness. And David begged and begged and begged for God to save the life of the child. And for seven days... He prayed and fasted, begging for the child to live. And once again, why not? The child didn't do anything wrong. Why should the child die? And yet, after seven days, the child did die. And of course, the servants of David were really afraid to tell him. Because if David was, going to, was acting that way while the child was alive, what's he going to do then? But interestingly enough, as soon as David heard the child had died, and he heard it because he saw all of them talking, and it says that he looks up and he goes, the child's dead, isn't he? And they said, yeah. It said that he got up, washed himself, and ate. And they were all surprised. Like, how can David be okay now, even though God directly said no, and the child died? And David's response is interesting. He said, while the child was alive, I said, who knows? Maybe the child's life will come back. But now that he is dead, there's nothing I can do. And he says something so interesting, he goes, he goes, I will go to him, but he will not come back to me. And what David understood is, though, is that even though the child had died, the child's soul was not lost, and someday he would see the child again. And what I truly believe happened in that time of prayer and fasting that David had with the Lord is, is that God said no, but God prepared David for the no. And then, uh, right now, currently, at, in, in my church, we're going through the book of Revelation. And that's fun. I love the book of Revelation. And we see sometimes during judgments that there are angels holding giant censers of incense, which are prayers. All right? And you wonder about the prayers where God answers, wait. Revelation shows us these prayers of waiting because there's these times where God is about to pour judgment on the ungodly. Or God is about to uh, enact his plan on the earth. And what happens is the angels with these censers of prayers dump the incense out. And what that is, is it's the prayers of the saints throughout all the ages of the church who have prayed, Lord Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, bring us justice. Lord Jesus, do what you said you would do. And God simply said, wait. As a matter of fact, the fifth seal that, that Jesus breaks on the scroll of, uh, that, of the, of, that's in heaven, it's, there, is a, there is an altar, and underneath the altar are the, all these martyrs. And they say, Lord, how long? How long until you will bring justice? And it says they are told to wait. Wait until the rest of your brothers also go through what you're going to go through. But yet, when God says wait, someday it'll happen. And as we see in Revelation, those prayers were never forgotten. Not one prayer ever falls upon a deaf ear of the Lord. He stores it up and stores it up for when it's going to happen. So the Bible tells us that there are answers. It's yes, no, and wait. And even though we may not like it, 
And I fully admit that. There have been many times in life where I've prayed to God and prayed to God. I've been adamant to God about things. And it, was, and, and it wasn't like bad things. It was like, God, I need a million dollars. Come on. You know? But it was genuine things. And God still said, not just wait. He said no. But I know this. That whether God says yes, no, or wait, because he is sovereign, because he is above all things, because of that, the no and the wait are just as good of answers as the yes. Because sometimes when God says no, it's not because he's mad or wants to disrupt or wants to disrupt your life or whatever. That no is saving you from the pain that a yes would have brought. It's saving you from the plans that God has in the future because if the yes happened, it would have been a path that wouldn't have been the path that God had for you later. And what does that require of us then? It requires faith in God to believe that he really, really is in control of all things. And I'm going to tell you right here from my own, from my own life, it, that is just not easy. It's not easy. To this very day, it's still not easy. We get frustrated. We get upset. We feel down. Sometimes we feel like we lose hope. But the person that we can always hope in is Jesus. And here's what I want you to know too. Is that when you get in those situations where you're down and don't know what to do, you go to God for that too. You say, God, this is where I am and I need your help. The one thing though that I think is important to understand though is, and one thing that I believe is maturity in our walk with Jesus is, is that God never does anything wrong. And so don't get to the point in your life where you accuse of God, God of wrongdoing, because guess what? You're going to be wrong every time. If you think God did something wrong, guess who's wrong in that scenario? You are. Because God is good. The Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to sin. He doesn't make mistakes. And so that's what's important to look at. So that's the introduction. Now we're going to get into the passage today. But all that means something because we're going to look at the life of a faithful mother who followed God and worshipped God and trusted in God even though things were not working out the way that, that it was going for her. And yet God remained faithful and she remained faithful to God. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we're going to look at the story of Hannah. And I'm sure my daughter Hannah is all excited because I just said her name, right? But we're going to look at the story of Hannah. And Hannah uh, was the mother of Samuel. All right, spoiler alert. She did end up having a baby, all right? Samuel. But the story of Hannah is a wonderful story of faithfulness in prayer. And I wanted us to look at it today. So 1 Samuel chapter 1. It says here, there was a certain man from Ramathiam, a Zuphite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jer Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of to Tohu, and son of Zuph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives, one called Hannah and one called Penana. Penana had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions to the meat of the meat to his wife, Penana, and to, her son, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. So we see already a problematic family dynamic. The problem was already is that Elkanah took two wives. Now, we see this happen a lot in Scripture. And one thing I want to point out to you is, is that God's plan has always been one man and one woman. But, but this is what these men did. And the Bible's not condoning it. It's just telling you how it happened. So we have a man here who did worship God, but yet he was wrong in this area. And one of the reasons why it was wrong was for this very reason. Is that he had two wives, but he loved one more than the other. And that made the other wife jealous. And the wife that was jealous was able to have children. 
which was certainly a blessing for women at that time. And the wife that Elkanah loved more, which was Hannah, could not have children. And women who could not have children at that time were seen of as cursed. You know, this is kind of a replay of way back early on in the book of Genesis, uh, the, the, uh, the wives of Jacob, Leah and Rachel. Now, in that case, Jacob only wanted Rachel, but of course Laban deceived him and married him to Leah. And then he married Rachel as well. He loved Rachel, didn't love Leah, but guess who was the only one who was able to have children, right? Leah was. And so in this case, we see once again, Hannah is more loved, but yet Penina has the children. And she uses that to irritate Hannah and provoke her. There's not a good relationship between these two women. But I want you to see here, once again, in verse 6, I mean, at the end of verse 5, it says, And the Lord had closed her womb. So here's what's interesting to look at here, is that it doesn't say that Hannah had done anything sinful or wrong. It says, though, that she was barren simply because the Lord had chosen that to be. And one thing that we should take this to understand in our own life is that sometimes there are things that happen in our life that we don't like. They're either, um, we either have a disability or, or a bad event happened or just something wrong. And it's, and it's important to know that just because something may not be right, it doesn't mean that it was God punishing you. It doesn't mean you did something wrong or sinful about it. It just means that God has made it that way for that time. You know, remember there was a, in the, Jesus came across a, a man who was blind. And, and the disciples said, Jesus, who sinned, the man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither one. He was born blind so that God's glory could be revealed. And what did Jesus do? He healed him of his blindness. And so in this case here, we see the scenario where God doesn't hate Hannah, is not upset with Hannah, but he has chosen for this time, as it says here, to close her womb. So, of course, she's being provoked and irritated by her, it says her, her rival. That's, that's always great, right? That's a great family home dynamic. But it says here, verse 7, this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. What do you suppose the thing she was saying was? If I was to guess, I would say things like, well, the Lord blesses me. The Lord cares about me. He must not care about you because he's not giving you children. He's not removed your shame. And so, and so in verse 8, it says, Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Probably, probably not the nicest. I mean, probably not the most comforting thing to say. I mean, we think about it. She's weeping over not having children. She's being provoked by her rival wife. And all Elkanah can say is, hey, aren't I better than ten sons? Come on. Probably not the most comforting thing in the world. But it says in verse 9, he says, Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. Now, this is, a, this is a really good verse to stop at for a second. Because, how is Hannah feeling? She is very upset. She's very frustrated. Year after year, she cannot get pregnant. And then because she cannot get pregnant, she's being um, heckled and provoked by, her rival, by the rival wife. She's being torn down by her. She goes to Elkanah, and Elkanah's relief is, aren't I better than kids? She doesn't know where to go. She doesn't know what to do. However, she goes to the Lord. It says, once again, in bitterness of soul. But what I want to point out here is, is that it doesn't say in bitterness of soul, she cursed the Lord or yelled at the Lord. As it says here, she wept and prayed to the Lord. And that's an important thing for us to know when it comes in our lives in humility. Is that what the Lord wants, requires of us is not for us to be proud or arrogant. He wants us to be humble. 
And when times in our life is that we don't understand and we are and we are weeping or we are frustrated, I mean, I mean, to the height of frustration, when we are tired and just don't want to do anything but stare at a wall for hours, right? Because we just can't take it anymore. We can go to the Lord and so that say those exact things, say, God, I am bitter in spirit. God, I am I am tired of people tearing me down and tired of people beating me down. I, you know, uh, as in, in Hannah's case, God, I just want to have children. All these things. Well, she goes to the Lord and prays. And look what even she says here in verse 11. She says that she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you only will look upon your servant's misery and remember me. Look how she says to the Lord, your servant. She doesn't come to him saying that she it deserves anything or she's owed anything. She's saying, I'm your servant. Will you please look upon my misery? And it says here, and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son that I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. And that's referring to a Nazarite vow. But what she's saying is, God, if you give me a child, I vow to you, this child will be yours and I'm giving him to you. And so, verse 12 says, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Okay? Who's Eli? He's the priest. And it says here, Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. All right? So he comes upon her, and he sees that she is praying, and she is moving her mouth, but there's nothing coming out, because she's just pouring her heart out to God. But Eli doesn't understand it. It says, Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. See, Hannah can't catch a break. She really can't. The rival wife keeps getting on her, okay? The husband's like, I'm more important to you than any kids would be. And then all of a sudden, the, the priest is saying, is watching her praying, saying, stop being drunk. She can't win. But you know who does hear Hannah? The Lord. The Lord. And it says, she says here, verse 15, she goes, Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. You know what I love about what Hannah's saying here is? When she says, you know, that I, your servant is not a wicked woman. I've been praying. In other words, through all of the hardship and trial, that Hannah's going through, she did not abandon God. And you know, in this day and age, and unfortunately with, with um, and I say this in quotations, American Christianity, comfort is a big deal for many people. And there are many, many churches filled with many people who are there in that church not because they're fully devoted to Jesus and willing to follow him and do whatever it takes for him and willing to be persecuted for him or go through anything else. But instead, they're sitting in church because as long as Jesus keeps them comfortable, they're cool about it. As long as they have that job security, as long as they have that money, as long as they have uh, the health that they want, as long as they can come to a church and see friends and sing some stuff and feel good and leave and go on and do whatever they want and act the way they want until they can come back to church the next Sunday, everything's great. Because unfortunately, many people have been sold a God of comfort, but all that has been has been an idol. Now, is God God of all comforts? Absolutely. But what people don't understand is, is that following Jesus does not mean you're going to be comfortable all the time. Just look at every apostle. Look at the prophets. Comfort was something that did not really exist for them. In the seven churches of Revelation, when Jesus is commending ones that are doing well and condemning ones that are doing, that are doing bad, you know the ones that he's condemning for doing well, you know what a trait is that most of them are sharing is? Persecution. Peter says in his letter that if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be persecuted in some way, somehow. I've always said, it's like, you know, in science, it's called that, you know, it's the litmus test. You know the little litmus paper strips? You want to know if something's an acid or something's a base? You just put the paper in, it's a different color, all right? Or if you check a pool, you know, the chlorine colors, whatever. It's the same thing with Christianity. If everything in the world is comfortable all the time, and you've got no opposition from anyone, 
You know, Jesus said this. He said, very, he said be, oh, be careful of when everyone speaks well of you. Oh, you mean, you mean people won't speak well of me? Yeah, because people are wicked and hate Jesus. And Jesus says if they, hate, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And so Hannah here, no matter what's happening to her, even though she is not comfortable, she's not abandoned God. And there are many today who, when the trouble comes, when the hardship comes, because they never really followed Jesus, they fall away. It's literally the seed that fell upon, that fell upon the shallow rock in, that, in, in the parable of the seed and the sower. It sprouted up for a, for a short time, and then when the trouble came, withered away. And that's not what God calls us to be. True worshipers of God stay faithful to him no matter what. And so what happened here, it says, he says here, I'm sorry, Eli says his response. He says, Eli answered, go in peace and may God of Israel, may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. And Samuel means, or sounds like, heard of God. That's what uh, a text note here says. So what happened? Hannah prayed, poured out her heart to God, and God finally said yes. Because God will do that. There are times where God does exactly that. And so now it was time for Hannah to follow through on what she told God. Here's what I love about this. She wasn't faithful to God until the answer came and then no more. She stayed faithful to God completely. What did she say? She said, God, if you give me a child, I will vow and, and give him to you. And she stayed true to that vow because she stayed true to God. It says, when the man Elkanah came up, verse 21, with all his family to offer annual sacrifice to the Lord to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, Elkanah, her husband told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought them to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord there. So Hannah stayed true to God in everything she did. And, I think, and, I, and that's what I want us all to understand too is that whether the answer is yes or no or wait, whatever result God gives us, we still stay true to God. Even if we don't understand why, even if we don't have any clue where God is going, guess what? Is, who's going to know more? You or God, right? We often think we know more in the scenario, in the time, but in truth, it's always God that knows more. We are never going to fail by trusting in God. We're never going to fail. And so it's interesting to know that what else did God grant Hannah? Well, she gave Samuel over to the service of the Lord. And jumping ahead in chapter 2, I want to close with this. It says, but Samuel was ministering before the Lord, verse 18. A boy wearing a, a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. What a sacrifice to the Lord. She asked God for a child. She literally gave the child over to them. But she didn't forget him, of course, certainly. And it says here, Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home, and the Lord gracious to Hannah was gracious to Hannah. She conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. So what happened with Hannah? She remained faithful, and what did God do? Continued to bless her. 
And I believe this, and I want us just to end on this. Whether God says yes, no, or maybe, I'm not, not maybe yes, no, or wait, he's still blessing you. And if you don't know how or why, and in your frustration of what's going on, go to God with that too and say, God, I'm frustrated, I'm upset, I don't understand, just help me. Give me the peace to be able to follow you, and he will. So, I'm thankful for faithful mothers, as we've seen that in our own lives. Mothers who are prayerful to God, worship God, follow God, raise their children to follow God. And I'm thankful for the example of Hannah, who is a good example of a faithful mother. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we thank you that you do hear our prayers in all times. Lord, we thank you that no matter what, whether the answer is yes, no, or wait, you are holy, you are good, and your answers are good. Lord, bless us today on this Mother's Day. Bless our time together with our families. And Lord, help us not to forget all that you've given us. And Lord, help us in our frustration. Help us in our fears. Help us in our struggles. Help get us through the times knowing that you are sufficient for all things. In your name we pray. Amen.